Welcome back to Atlanta Diaries. I'm your host Enma Popley. Thank you for joining me. In Atlanta Diaries, we celebrate unique and inspiring stories of breakthrough women to help future generations create their own. If you want to know more about Atlanta or listen to more episodes, you can visit my website www.enmapopley.com. You can also share feedback or suggestions there. My guest today is Shaheen Mistry. Shaheen was born in Mumbai, grew up in five countries around the world, and at the age of 18 returned to Mumbai to do something about the unequal opportunities that children have in India. She founded the first Akanksha Center in 1989 with only 15 children. The Akanksha Foundation today runs 26 Akanksha schools, impacting over 14,000 students and 4,000 student alumni. In 2008, searching for a way to impact more children and inspired by the teach for america model shaheen founded teach for india with the audacious vision of providing an excellent education to impact more children across india by building a movement of leaders today teach for india impacts 34000 children through the direct work of 1000 fellows shaheen serves on the boards of the kanksha foundation and the advisory board of museums of solutions She has been a recipient of many accolades including the Beyond Business ET Prime Women Leadership Award for 2020 and the Niti Aayog's Women Transforming India Award. Shaheen has built the largest network of education change makers in the country. Without further ado, let's listen to Shaheen's inspiring journey. Hi Shaheen, a very very warm welcome to the show. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. Awesome. The funny story in this conversation, and I want to share it is. I mean, I don't even know if I should call it the funny story. I started my volunteering journey almost eight years back, and when I went to Jaywakil and I spoke to everybody, you know, I don't know how many times I heard your name that day, and <laughs> I felt like a little bit of an ignorant person. You know, like what is this? Like everybody is talking about Shaheen, and I don't even know who that person is, and I. quietly came back and googled your name and i was like oh my god like how did i no- not know who this inspiring person is and i wondered if i'll ever meet you so i do want to say that i'm really really honored and excited to chat with you today thank you appreciate the opportunity to be able to do this this is great so from here shaheen for the benefit of the listeners do you think you know you just you're giving a little introduction and how you see your place in the world is that a good way to start the conversation sure that's a beautiful question how do you see your place in the world i think for me it started out very early i spent a lot of time volunteering as a student i lived in many different countries i had many different experiences i grew up with a lot of privilege and i would travel back home to india to visit cousins and grandparents so i was constantly exposed to this world of equity and inequity all the time and started questioning very very early on why i had the opportunities that i had and i think really my place in the world came from the realization that i had done absolutely nothing to deserve where i was and the best way i could explain it to myself as a young girl was somebody flipped a coin and i got lucky and so i felt a responsibility very early on to do something about a world that just didn't feel fair to me and i think that's really been my place in in the world has been to say how do i make the world a little bit more fair by creating opportunities for children through education that felt like not certainly the only way to make the world a better place but it felt like a very strong bet to me thank you for sharing this you know like i literally made these last minute notes and the question which came to my mind was you know you've said so many times that you're entitled and we all feel very entitled and i was wondering that do you ever feel guilty then for this you know situation and if i'm hearing you correctly you've actually reframe my perspective just in a jiffy you know like saying that it's just luck so rather than feeling guilty just pay back and solve for it 
you know, the inequity and everything else. Does that sort of make sense? Is that a good way to look at it? I mean, I think it's such a difficult emotion, guilt. I think I felt guilt for uh, for many years until I realized that it, it doesn't have a lot of purpose. The emotion of guilt, like it doesn't help. It pulls you down, but it isn't motivating. So I think what I tried to do over time is just focus on what I could do with a lot of humility around the idea that like, it's just never going to be enough. Like whatever I do is always going to be a tiny amount, but at least if I'm trying to do it, there's a sense of I'm part of the solution and not adding to the problem. And I think that reframing helped lessen the guilt over time. The other thing that really lessened the guilt was the kids I worked with. I mean, they were incredible. Like I would feel so conscious of coming in different clothes or driving a car to school. And my kids never made me feel that way. Like they accepted me for who I was and they helped me see wealth and what one has in a much, much broader way than I think my very sort of naive, ignorant perspective was in, in those early days. And is the guilt still there or does it ever come and go? Or have you sort of made peace with that and reframed your perspective? Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's guilt as much as just like deep sadness, like waves of sadness that come from time to time. I think just so many of the people that I work with and I know struggle with challenges so much bigger than their ability to manage those challenges. It, that often feels very unfair, especially when they're children. There is that sadness. There are many, many emotions in this work. I know when I welcome our new teachers and every year I describe the work as a roller coaster of emotions because literally within one day, there are multiple emotions. And so you swing between like anger and frustration and deep inspiration, the joy that comes with working with children. But there are certainly like many downs on that path as well. Yeah, I don't know how to even describe this shine. When I was just doing research about you and, you know, understanding more, I went through those emotions and just those TED Talks. I can only imagine what you're going through. So you know, like you said, let's just take action. So in from this perspective, you know, what was the defining moment for you that prompted you then to start the Akancha Foundation? Yeah, I mean, so my most defining moment was the moment that brought me back to India, actually. And this was a moment where, you know, I was, I was at Tufts University, I was here on vacation in between my first and second year. And I was at a traffic light in Bombay. And few kids ran up to the window. I was in a black and yellow taxi and they were begging for money. And in that moment, I just told myself like I wanted to be in India. And I'm not really sure what led to that feeling. And I'm sure, you know, I've had that feeling many times. And most of the times you just brush away those feelings and move on and go back to your life. But in that particular moment, I went home, called my dad, who was already back in the US, and he had my flight booked to go back a few days later. And I said, I just don't want to come back. Like, I think I want to be in India and I want to do something. And that was a very strong instinct, nothing really more than, than that. So that was a very defining moment. And I think because, of course, a lot of people questioned that decision and didn't understand why I wanted to do that, it made me even more rebellious. I was already quite a rebellious kid, but it made me even more rebellious and, and like, I need to make this work now. And that I think prompted me to then try to discover Bombay in a different way than I had known it before. So I went into jails and into communities and into the high court. And so I just tried to understand a different part of the city. And as part of that, there was a second defining moment where when I walked into a low income community very close to my grandmother's house where I stayed, I met a girl. I was 18 and she was 18 and I didn't speak any Hindi at all. And she spoke no English at all, but she smiled and welcomed me into her home. Her name is Sandhya. And she just told me to sit down and I was fascinated by her and her life. And a few children ran into her home and that really became my first classroom. And so that relationship and friendship that evolved with 
Sandhya, she was from such a different background. You know, I don't know how we really communicated with a lot of hand gestures. And eventually I brought a friend along to translate a little bit. But that was a very defining moment. That really helped segue into the conversation further. I read again a lot about how your nani has played a role in making you what you are. So would you like to share about that right now? Like it's so heartwarming, all those stories which I read about. Yeah. You know, it is incredible to me that I don't think there is a single week where I don't actively think about my nani in some way or the other. I don't think while she was alive, I even understood what a profound impact she had had on my life. But she was such a free spirit in a world that seemed very conformist to me. So my nani, for example, during the summer would only eat mangoes. Like she would eat eight mangoes a meal. At the age of like 75 or 80, she decided to start painting. And then she just never stopped painting. And she had enough money. She would go to the local jewelry store and buy these little gold trinkets to give as gifts to people. But she refused to take a taxi. She thought that was a waste of money. She'd jump onto an overcrowded BST bus. So she was just such a free spirit. And she really lived life the way she wanted to live life. She was one of the most creative people I ever met. And she never cared about what other people thought, including us. She would tell us like, take it or leave it. You know, you don't want to take it, just go. And I think that courage that she had, the creativity, the ability to say, I'm going to live life on my own terms, the crazy level of trust she had in people. You know, I, I lived with her for a while and these random people she would bring into the house who she'd met in an elevator and she'd had a discussion and she'd say like these young foreigners are traveling, let them come. And she would move me out of my room into her room and so I think the main thing I loved about her was that courage to speak her mind and to be who she really wanted to be. That's amazing. Shine, so you also spoke about your relationship with Sandhya. Is she still part of the journey? And who were the other people who were in that very, very difficult journey? Like, I can imagine the number of naysayers you must have, you know, encountered at that time. Yeah. Yeah, so Sandhya was the first person I met. She just welcomed me into her house and into her life. She had a very elderly mother who was very excited about showing me everything about Indian festivals and taking me to all her relatives' homes. So they really sort of half adopted me in those early days and they let their little 10 foot by 10 foot home become the classroom where I taught. And so that was very, very special the first child I ever saw, and I actually had a camera with me on that day, a real camera at the time, and took a photograph of her. Her name is Pinky, and I lost touch with her many years later, but I often show people that photograph of Pinky because she had these like really big sparkly eyes. And I find this with Indian children everywhere. If you look into kids' eyes, you see this sparkling potential. And I remember being so struck by that potential in her eyes and at the same time so worried that she wouldn't have the opportunity to reach that potential. So she was a real landmark sort of symbol that has stayed with me for many years as well. And then the early days were all like Xavier's students because I was at St. Xavier's College and everyone at that time used to bunk a lot of classes and sit in the canteen. And I would go around to all these young people in my class um, funny story, I was the only college student who wore a Khadi sari and big colored bindis every day because I was just in love with India. So I wanted to just be Indian when I came back. But I would go um, and talk to all these people in the canteen and say, there's so many problems in India. Don't you want to do something about it? And pretty much everybody would say yes. And then I would be like, well, if you want to do something about it, why aren't you doing something about it? And the most often answer I got was the problems are just too big. Like, how can I make a difference as one person? How can I make a difference? And so I went home and I started painting all these posters that really just said, 
as one person, you can make a difference. And I put them up all over college. And, and so the people that came forward who saw those posters and listened to my, my rants in those early days became the first volunteers at Akanksha. And I feel very, very grateful to them because the first four years of Akanksha, we didn't have a single paid staff. Our only expense was the bus that would take the children from the community to the school. And everyone was just volunteering. We didn't really know what we were doing. We would sit on Sundays and sort of discuss what we had learned in school. None of us were trained teachers. But there was a lot of pure intention, a lot of passion, dedication uh, to want to serve children and to learn what we needed to learn. This is so amazing. And I have to stop using that word again and again, because everything you're going to talk about is going to be inspiring. Uh, so, you know, you spoke about the fact that you had to literally knock at 19 schools, like go to 19 schools yeah. till finally, you know, father, I'm, I forget his name, I said know. yes to you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then you just grabbed the opportunity and said, we're going to start the very next day. Yeah. So yeah. help me see that scenario. And was it truly as impulsive as that? Yeah. Yeah, it was. So basically what happened was I had started teaching in Sandhya's home. And very soon in a few months, I realized that like, unless we get our kids to be in a physical school and see something outside of the community, it's going to be very hard for them to aspire to something different. And so then I started searching for schools. And as you said, I went to, I don't know, 19, 20, 21 schools. And I mean, I think that built my conviction to do this work more than anything else, because I was appalled at the response I got from school leaders, including these were convent schools, these were like all kinds of schools, government schools. People said, this is a great idea, Shaheen, but it's too revolutionary for us. People said, our children who study here are higher income and they will get diseases from your children. I even had one sister who said, you know, your children are from the fishing village. They wear glass bangles and they will scratch our desks. And that's why you can't use the classrooms in the afternoon. So I was very fueled by a lot of anger saying like, all I'm asking for is a space that is locked up for two hours a day. I literally told school leaders that I would carry a broom with me. I would clean the classroom. I would carry everything back and forth. And I still couldn't find a space. And so finally, I was sort of on the verge of giving up. And I walked into the Holy Name School in Calaba in Bombay. And I met Father Ivo D'Souza. And I walked right into his office. And I basically said, Father, my life is in your hands. Because like, this is it. Like, if you say no, like, I don't know where else to go. I've been to 20 odd schools and everyone has said no. And I think he was just very amused by, by that statement. And he said, what do you need? And I said, I need a classroom for two hours every afternoon. That's all I need, nothing else. And he said, okay. And so then he said, when do you want to start? And I was so nervous that he would change his mind that I just said tomorrow. And like, as you said, it was very impulsive. I had no idea how it would start tomorrow. I went back to college. I sort of mobilized a lot of people. I said, even if you don't want to volunteer, just pretend to be volunteers for the first week and help me out. And that's really how we started. You've said in a lot of places, I'm a foolish dreamer. So how do you then, you know, ensure that everybody speaks the same language? Like how do you bring people who dream the way you dream? people who resonate with your dream, who understand your dream and carry on with you? Yeah, I mean, I don't know the answer to that. I feel like it just happens organically. I think ideas draw people. And when I said, this is what I want to do, and really my idea was very simple. My idea was like, we have everything we need in India to educate our children. We have kids who need to be educated. We have young people who have time to teach and we have spaces that are lying vacant. And so all we need to do really is bring these three together. We need to convince people that have spaces to give them. We need to convince people that have time to give the time and kids want to learn naturally. 
And I think that idea just appealed to people. Like it was simple. You know, I was asking people to give a small amount of time. Like you can go to your movies as a young person and you can attend classes and you can hang out with your friends and two hours a week come and teach, you know? And I think the simplicity of it, keeping the bar of entry a little bit lower helped people. And I also realized, Emma, that like, Everybody wants to do good. It's been like one of my big realizations over time that people may forget the way people may feel fear around the first step. But like there is something in us that wants to help others. And often people just don't have that platform. And what I found at Xavier's was these young people just needed a platform. And when you made it easy for them and you said, all you need to do is this and come in once a week for, and you know, I'm going to bring the kids in. I'm going to organize the space. You just come and teach. And when you give them freedom and responsibility together. So like there was no set curriculum. There was no, like, it was really like, let's try to understand what our kids need and let's try to deliver that to them. And let's learn really, really fast because we don't know what we're doing. So let's continually like ask people, try to gather whatever expertise we can, read a lot, learn a lot, ask for help a lot. So I think those pieces actually helped align some people towards this vision. So when did you become, you know, sort of more strategic or more intentional about then the approach of Akanksha? Like, is it as free-spirited even today? No, it's very different. I think four years after we started Akanksha, I was interviewing a teacher who's still a dear friend called Rachna to come in and, and be a volunteer. And it ended up being she interviewing me and giving me a lot of advice. And this was one of the things she said. She said, it's high time you become more structured. And she said, while volunteers are great, they come and go and they have other priorities and you need like full-time staff and you should hire me. And that was like a turning point, I think. And I hired her and she was a great teacher. She was our first Akansha paid teacher. And then I think the second impetus for becoming more structured was after we registered formally as a trust and we were able to raise money, we then needed to put certain things in place to be able to raise the money. And then I think the next big impetus was when we wanted to scale from one center where obviously like I could do everything myself and I could be there every day myself. We scaled it up eventually to 60 centers. And as we grew the centers, we needed to put like system structures in place. Having said that, like I've always been a believer that keep the structures as simple as you can and really be guided by what children need. And so the most important question I would ask and the team would ask every year was like, what do our kids need? And so Akanksha really evolved in response to that question. And so as our girls got older, some of them wanted to learn sewing. We started sewing class. We found that they needed a channel to express themselves. We started Art for Akanksha, which blossomed into this incredible creative program for kids. So we really followed the needs of our children as they got even older. We paired them up with mentors because we found they needed a lot of guidance in terms of careers, et cetera. So in that way, while it was an after school program, which it was for many years before we went into formal schools, we had a lot of autonomy to really experiment and to follow the needs of our children without being sort of burdened with the wider needs of the system. Very interesting. Shaheen, is that what led to Teach for India then? You know, like it's shifting gears a little bit. What made you extend to the Teach for India umbrella? And you know, the other thought which comes to my mind is that looking at the audacious goals you had in mind, is it that Akanksha won't be able to solve for all that? Is that why Teach for India really uh, started? Yeah. So I think Teach for India for me, definitely started because of the children at Akanksha. You know, we all know that education changes lives, but I think I was so lucky to see that journey with children in such a close and direct way that I was just amazed. I always feel like one regret I have is that I didn't have an even higher bar when I started because my kids 
fully exceeded the expectations I had of them. And when they did that, and I saw changes in the children that I worked with, it just felt like a really big responsibility to expand that and to say, if that's possible with a Seema and a Parveen and a Sumit, then how do you make it possible at scale? And when I asked that question, the answer that I came back to was leadership. Like, if you really want to do this at scale, you need leaders at all levels of the system who are committed to that idea. You need leaders in the classroom, but you also need leaders at the level of the education ministry who all believe that our kids deserve and need and we can give them an excellent education. And so that really is what led me to studying the Teach for America model because the Teach for America model was very centered around this idea that like, if you change the leadership in the system, you can start to move the needle on education. But really it was like the individual children and seeing that proof and that evidence of what education was able to do to their lives. And Emma, that wasn't just academic. Like academics was a huge part of it. Like I remember the day that I heard that one of our students, Jyoti, got admission into St. Xavier's College, which was my college. And I was like, I never thought that that was possible. So the academic piece was a huge part of it. But the changing of their value systems and their orientation towards the world for me was an even more powerful part of it. So kids who were suddenly aware of issues and challenges in their community, but actually like, sticking out their necks and raising their voices to change those challenges and issues, that felt like very, very empowering and worth scaling. Sure. Were there experiences or situations where when they went back home, you know, you realize that that's sapping their energy or they're losing the motivation when they come back the next day? I think that was a huge concern for us. In fact, the pivot in the Akanksha model from an after-school center to a full school model came from that challenge that actually like there were three different systems that our kids had to face and all three were giving them different messages every single day. They were going to a government school, they were getting one set of messages, one form of education, they were coming to the Akanksha Center that was very different, much more innovative, engaging form of education. We would tell them to speak up and then they would go home often to quite conservative families, and there would be a mismatch there as well. And while our kids learned over time, mostly to navigate that, like it felt like a very big burden for children to carry. And that led us to say, can we actually become the school itself? So at least we eliminate the other school. And there's one school and that school also looks at parent engagement and bringing parents along. So we eliminate these like different forms of conflict in our children's lives. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I can only imagine it must have been so difficult for you to really let go at some level of a Kanksha and fully focus your energies on building those leaders for Teach for India. So... Can we talk about the journey of a fellow at, at Teach for India or your journey vis-a-vis both Akanksha and Teach for India? How did you stay connected? Yeah, sure. So it's a funny story, actually, because I never really planned to leave Akanksha, as in like they never even gave me a farewell because I was convinced by Wendy, who was the founder of Teach for America and was very instrumental in helping us thought partner when we wanted to start Teach for India. So we were planning Teach for India while I was working full-time at Akansha. And my aim always was to help them plan it, to find a CEO for Teach for India, and then to just go back full-time to Akansha. And so I was working these two jobs and trying to plan it in the evenings. We were doing a, a blueprint with McKinsey till late at night, every night. And then my day job would be Akansha. And we looked for a CEO for the better part of a year and couldn't find someone. And through that year, Wendy at different times kept telling me, why don't you just do it? And then finally, she said, look, just do it for a year. Get it off the ground because otherwise we'll miss a whole nother cycle 
And so that sounded reasonable. And I said, okay, I'll I'll get it off the ground. We'll continue to look for a CEO and then I'll come back. And as you know, like with most decisions in life, once you do something, it takes you in a different direction. So that's how I landed up at Teach for India. I think, again, interestingly, my heart has always been with children, not with adults. And so when I left Akansha, I wasn't that excited about the idea of working with fellows as my primary point of contact who would then impact children. At that stage at Akanksha also where so many good things were finally starting to happen. We were seeing so many things happen with our kids. And so that was my starting point at Teach for India. Like I believed a lot that fellows were very important because otherwise we could never get to scale. But my own personal connection was much more with children than with fellows. That also, Emma, has shifted drastically over time. Like today, I love working with adults and I love working with children and I still do uh, work with children as well. But I think that idea of like building leadership and seeing especially young people in their 20s, 30s really change and shift their sense of purpose, grow in their leadership. I think that is very, very powerful. And at Teach for India, the journey of a fellow, so one is we put a lot of thought into where we recruit from and how we select our fellows. We're really looking for bright, some of our brightest, most committed young people from across the country who really want to make a difference in education and who really want to make a difference in India, in building a better India. And then we have thousands of people apply to the program, about 15, 20,000 year on year. We select between six and 8% of people that apply to the program. And so that's where their journey starts. Once they're selected, they come to, it's a beautiful space, which we call the Teach for India Institute. And it's a residential five-week program where all of these hundreds of people that get selected come in together. And you sort of see them on the first day. They look a little bit lost because they've all come from different parts of the country. Um, And then by day two, it's almost like you're in a sea of revolutionaries because these are all like high passion people who believe that there needs to be change in the country, that education needs to change, that kids deserve better. And there's an energy to that training space, which is just absolutely magical. And so that's the first leg of their journey, the five-week boot camp where they're really learning about the culture of Teach for India, about the building blocks of strong starting teaching. They go into communities, they understand children, they understand equity. And then they go to one of our eight cities where we have placement schools. So we have tie-ups with government schools, with low-income private schools, And they are placed for two years as a full-time teacher in a classroom. So we really tell them in these two years, do whatever you can um, to really put your children on a fundamentally different life path, because that's the opportunity you have at Teach for India. And because that is such a challenging experience for them and the kinds of things they see, in many ways, the classrooms are like a microcosm of poverty. They see what unemployment does to a family. They see health issues. They see abuse. And so their leadership grows in a really exponential way because they're in service of children, but also confronting and trying to overcome these challenges. That's beautiful. Any anecdotes or stories of any of the fellows you can share with us? I know there are so many and it's hard to make a choice, but love to know some growth of any fellow or any such story. Yeah, I can tell you one story that spans Akanksha and TFI, because I think that's been beautiful also to see how things come full circle. But this was a little girl who came into Akanksha when she was about 10 or 11 years old. Her name's Seema, and she had a wonderful teacher called Rajshri. And Seema didn't like school. She would run away, and Rajshri would go patiently every day to the community to bring her to the center. At that time, the Akansha Center was housed in the planetarium building in the basement. And, you know, over time, she started coming. She still didn't have a lot of self-belief. And I remember her telling me that, you know, I used to tell Rajri Didi that I don't believe in myself. 
And Rajri Didi would say, it's okay, Seema, if you feel that way right now, but I believe in you. Seema was from a, a single parent family. Both her elder brothers had not completed school. No one in her community had ever gone to college. Fast forward, she was the first child to complete school, go to college, complete college. And then at the end of college, she applied for an MBA program. She really wanted to pull her family out of poverty. And coincidentally, she also applied in the same year for the Teach for India Fellowship. This was year two of the program. And she called me a few weeks after this whole thing happened. And she said, Didi, I don't know what to do. I got accepted into both the MBA program and the Teach for India Fellowship. And I said, Seema, I said, you go home. I'm sure spend some quiet time with yourself. Ask yourself what you really feel inside you you want to do. I'm sure you'll figure it out. And I heard a couple of days later that she had turned down the MBA program and joined the Teach for India Fellowship. I asked her later, I said, what led you to take that decision? And she said, I had a teacher who changed my life. What more could I ever aspire to do than be a teacher who changes the lives of others? So she moved to Pune, to our Pune site. She taught there for two years. Uh, she was a fantastic teacher. I remember towards the end of her fellowship, she actually staged a whole production of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory with her own students. And then she went on to start a school. She ended up then working with the government on education projects at scale. She then went on to work in a high-income school, trying to get high-income students to contribute back to communities. So that, for me, feels like such a, a beautiful circular story of someone who went to, through a program but then came back and is contributing so much in her own way. But there are countless stories, Emma, like that, that I could tell you. <laughs> <laughs> and I can see you light up when you talk about it. And that's why I was saying that how hard it must have been for you to let go, metaphorically, of Akanksha and, you know, focus only on um, Teach for India. Yeah, you know, interestingly, it was a lot easier than I thought it would be. And I think partly it was just a lot of trust in the people at Akanksha. And the board, you know, today, Emma, there are my students who are staff members at Akanksha who have been at Akanksha longer than I was at Akanksha. I was at Akanksha for 17 years. And I now go, they have this beautiful annual day each year where they celebrate people. And there are now students of ours who've completed 20 years in the social work department. And so I think letting go was a very good idea. And, you know, Akanksha has just grown in very beautiful ways since then. You know, Shaheen, I saw this uh, video of one of your TED Talks where I saw little Kusum explaining about the vision of Teach for India. That completely blew me away. And, you know, I'm sort of even giving you in context. So, you know, my self-imposed role for Jay Vakil is that I'm the team coach. And my single point agenda is that I want to make sure that we institutionalize culture at Jay Vakil. Okay. Yeah. And like you said, in my own little way, sitting in the US, I'm, you know, trying very hard and doing whatever I can. But when I saw that little Kusum talking, you know, and sharing about it, it just felt literally from the heart. Like, you know, it didn't feel like it's curated. It didn't feel like it's, I don't even know how to explain. And, and I told myself if an eight, I, I don't even know if she's more than eight or 10 years old. If a 10 year old can appeal like this, what is it that Teach for India or Shine is doing right that she's making sure that at every level the you know Teach for India values and culture is being communicated? Yeah, I'm so happy that that video spoke to you. I remember the first time I watched it as well, and that was a completely non-planned video. Like the videographer just took the camera in and just asked those questions to Kusum, and I remember watching it and just sobbing when I saw it the first time and I must have seen it a hundred times since then because as you said she was able to articulate in such a simple yet profound way what we believe education should be and at Teach for India we say 
Like we need to expand the purpose of education. Education, at least in our country, in India, has become about competition and rote learning and examinations and self and getting a job. And like while self matters, of course, Education is also about uplifting others around you and valuing others and learning to listen. And education is also about the country and making your community and your city and your country better. And this little girl in the video was able to articulate that so beautifully. And, you know, she says in the video, she says, you can't do it alone. She's like, you have to think about building a house. Can you build a house alone? No, right? You all need to come together. And I was like, these are such profoundly simple truths of life that she has imbibed from her teacher. And that's so beautiful. But I think, how does it filter down? I mean, one, I think by the practice of your own life and making that transparent. And so I think what I've tried to do is share a lot of stories of my own experiences, and the many times when I'm not able to live the values that I uphold, right? Like every day, there are things that I do that I'm proud of, and there are things that I could do better. So I think making that transparent. And then I think how you hire the people around you and finding people that, of course, have the skills, but even more importantly, like share those core values and beliefs and then holding the bar really high on culture like you know we talk a lot at Teach for India and we say like of course the outcome matters but the journey to get there matters equally you know like we are in pursuit of excellence but we're going to do it in a way in which we hold each other we care for each other and I I think I've learned this with children that Like if you want to really challenge and hold kids to a high bar, you have to shower them with love. You can't do it without that. Like you have to genuinely adore them. Even the kids who drive you the most crazy in your class. If you really want to have those results, I think the idea of love becomes very central there. So talk to me more about this, Shaheen. How have you upward filtered it? You know, I think the challenge is also there. Like, you know, that Kusum is so inspired and motivated and she got it from that teacher. So how did that teacher imbibe it? I'm sure you've been really interested about building that culture. Yeah, you know, I feel so lucky that I've learned from so many people and examples that the detail of how you break down values into practice is so important in actually helping people or an organization embed the value. And I I remember a funny story years ago, we had some visitors from a really well-known network in the US called KIPP. They were visiting a classroom And at that time, we had our kids used to wear little Akanksha T-shirts. They would have the Akanksha sun on the front and on the back, it was written, speak in English. And and this was because we were trying to encourage the kids in this particular classroom to speak in English. And I remember they came in and the kids would not speak in English. And they came to me and they turned to me and they said, why are the kids in this classroom wearing these T-shirts? So I was a little taken aback. I said, what do you mean? And they said, well, we think that if they're wearing the t-shirts and it's a commitment that I'm wearing a t-shirt that says speak in English, then if I'm not speaking in English, maybe you should ask them to go to the bathroom, turn their t-shirts inside out and come back into class because they're not upholding their commitment. And it was it was such a tiny example, but it, what it left me with is how do you see a commitment or a value down to the detail of a structure and a practice every single day. And that's what we've tried to do with our values. We've said, like, love isn't just telling kids, I love you, I love you. Love is when you're a teacher and you're not feeling well, taking that effort to make sure that you have a plan in place for a substitute teacher to teach. That's loving your children. Now, you don't generally define that as love, But I think breaking it down in that way is very, very helpful. And then embedding it like reflection, for example, we just embed as a structure into everything. So every lesson plan has reflection in it. Every session that we do ends with feedback and reflection. So I think like taking the values and getting people and really holding space for people to understand and internalize them 
becomes very, very important. And we do all kinds of random things. Like I remember several times in a group of like a hundred fellows when we're training them and we're trying to explain love, we're also talking about like love, not just for people who you know, but love for anyone. Like if we believe in fraternity and that everyone is our brother and sister. So we'll often ask for anyone to volunteer, anyone in their life who's struggling. So someone may say, for example, my aunt is struggling with her health. And then all hundred people will send a message to that one aunt. And again, then you'll process like, what did it mean to love or share a wish for someone that you don't even know? And how did that feel and was it difficult and what made it difficult and so there's a lot of like practicing some of these values and then reflecting on them that I think over time helps it seep through the organization that's beautiful thank you for sharing this Shaheen Shaheen let's shift gears a little bit you're a single mom you've got two kids of your own but clearly that's not your kid it's the whole (laughs) teach for India and the Akanksha fraternity how do you strike that balance yeah I mean, if you ask my mom, she'll say not very well. I would agree with her. I think it's been a real struggle. When you talked about guilt earlier in the conversation, this is where I think I felt the most guilt for a long time until I also learned that guilt there also was very, very unhealthy. And I just let go of it. Like literally overnight, I said, I need to accept. And and in fact, the chairman of my board for the first 10 years of Teach for India and before that for many years at Akanksha's Anu Aga, who's one of the people I have just the most deep respect for. And I remember one day I was talking to her about all these struggles of, you know, I'm not able to do what I need to for my kids and I'm not able to do what I need to at work and I'm constantly feeling pulled and she sat me down and as she often does and she said, Shaheen, why do you think you're a superwoman? I hope you know you're not a superwoman, you know. And she said, get yourself off the pedestal and understand that that you are are very deeply flawed. And all of us are. And actually, the, the beauty of being human is in that. And that message really helped me. I just changed the way I thought of myself. I said, it's okay. Like if I can't be there for every birthday party that's okay. And if I'm dropping a few balls at work, that's also okay, because the sum total of what I'm able to do. And maybe for me, it's more important that I leave my girls with a legacy of my own contribution to the world. And maybe they'll take that, maybe they won't. But like, that's the legacy I I am going to leave them with. And there is a sacrifice and a compromise I'm making for leaving them with that legacy, but it's a choice I've made. So that's mainly it. I mean, the only other thing I would add to it is I think the more self-aware I've become, the more I've been able to understand where the balance feels off for me. I think for many years, I was very worried about how other people would see the balance. But I began to realize over time that like when it feels imbalanced to me, then let me recenter and let me shift something. Let me create more time on one side or the other side. And I found that very helpful because I think ultimately for me, one of the most important things is to be able to go to sleep at night, basically being at peace with yourself. And for me, that realization that I, I know when I'm overstretching or when I'm ignoring my kids or like when it feels wrong to me, then rather than beating myself up about it, let me just try to recenter a little bit. Let's come back to this world of social needs and impact. There must have been moments of despair when you felt demotivated, given the situation, given the number of stakeholders you have to work with. How did you then or how do you continue to cultivate hope when there is this feeling of helplessness, like at every level? This also sort of makes me double click on how will you define your leadership style? Because I think that's what probably brings that hope and uplifts people and uplifts your team. Yes, I'll try and answer those together. Um, I think the first is, and all of my qualities have a burn. So let's see them on a spectrum. But I think the first is that I am very naturally 
able to see the future and what is working much more than I'm able to see the truth. In that way, I'm a little bit naive. I'm a, a bit of a dreamer. I'm much more comfortable in a space that feels positive. Like I struggle to read the news every day. And I think the advantage of that has been it's very easy for me to see the positives. Like often I walk out of a situation and I've seen 10 things that I want to keep talking about. And the person next to me hasn't even seen five. I'm, I'm naturally drawn to what is working. I'm an idealist. I'm an optimist. That's the positive side of it. I think the burn of it is I've often taken ideas, many, many ideas back to the team and not really understood how difficult it is to translate something into high quality execution. And so it's often left people around me feeling very inspired, very challenged, like they're able to do something they didn't think they were able to do, but also at the same time, very overwhelmed because of what it takes to make something happen. So I think that's one aspect of my leadership. The second is I do draw a lot of energy from people and I, I love people and I feel able to embrace many different parts of, of people. And so the ability to really love and care for people, not as professionals, but just as people first has allowed me then to hold a very high bar and, and challenge people. And that's been an interesting like and that I've tried to hold over time. Like how do you hold a bar of excellence, but how do you also like really care and love people at the same time? The third is, again, I think many of these are ands that define my leadership, but the and of like being really bold in terms of what I think we can achieve. And at the same time, being very committed and inspired by tiny steps. And I think I'm able to hold both of those. So even if, you know, right now, for example, we have like a bold dream of nurturing 50,000 leaders, that's our sort of next stop at Teach for India. And that feels like very inspiring to me, very energizing to me. And also, if we don't reach 50,000, I'm not that bothered about it because I know that the spirit of that goal is going to take us further than if we didn't have that goal in place. So I think a defining feature of my leadership is I'm also not that concerned about failing. Maybe I learned this from my nanny as well. I'm not that concerned about what people think. I mean, I am, but not excessively. And so my ability to like stretch for things and dream bold dreams, it becomes a little bit easier because of that. Mm, that makes sense. You're talking about the fact that you're reimagining the role of children in education. You've literally spoken about how you're wanting to make them partners in this journey. What does this mean? And that's again, a very bold dream. Yeah, thank you for asking that. This is something that like does keep me awake at night because I feel so excited by this idea. But the idea is this, right? If you look at India today, we have 260 million school going children. And so for those of us in education, when we see all the breakdowns in the education system, that feels really overwhelming. Like, how do you provide an excellent education to 260 million children? When you reframe that and you say, children aren't actually the thing you need to fix, but they're partners in this work of educating 260 million children, the whole paradigm shifts, like suddenly they are there with you. They're your asset. They're your biggest asset. And together, you're going to reach that goal. Now, what does that look like in real words? Because it's a lofty idea. It looks like defining the role of the child in the system differently. So in a classroom, for example, rather than our traditional image of a teacher stands at the front of the class and teaches 30 children, suddenly everybody's a learner and the kids are teaching the teacher and kids are teaching each other. And a kid who's a little bit more compassionate is teaching that. And someone who's better at math is teaching that. So it becomes this like many to many ecosystem within a classroom. And then if you look at that at the level of a school, it looks like 
a principal not sitting saying, oh my God, I have 10 problems in the school, but literally putting those problems in the middle of a circle of teachers and students and saying, how do we solve this together? And if you take it all the way to the top level of the system, it looks like the next time education policy is drafted in the country, we have equal numbers of children and policymakers sitting together drafting that policy. But this idea is very like natural and intuitive in business. Like in business, you would never decide something without asking your customers, why do you want this product? What product do you want? How should we create it? You know, you would always involve them as real equal stakeholders. And yet in education, we don't do that. We don't ask children, why do you want to be educated? What kind of learning do you want? How do you want to learn? And so I think there's a real opportunity to reframe the role of the child in the system. And where have you reached in in that goal? So we started a project under Teach for India five years ago called the Kids Education Revolution with an express mission to do this, to like bring together educators and students to reimagine education together. And we've done the most fantastic experiments. We've run large scale education conferences where children are teaching educators. So we're flipping the equation. We're bringing together people in retreats where teachers and students are problem solving around issues in education that they want to problem solve. Most recently, we're working on a musical right now where a group of children are on a journey to understand India's constitutional values of liberty, equality, fraternity, and justice. And they're on sort of a magical journey to say, what would it mean for them to show educators and children around the country how we can actually build these values into classrooms right from like second grade um, and onwards. So KER, the Kids Education Revolution, is the culmination of all of these sort of different experiments, but they're all bringing educators and children together in partnership. It's like an educator brings something that's different, a child brings something that's different, and together they're just stronger. Wow. (laughs) I'm completely flabbergasted. (laughs) It might sound a little shallow, but I think it's worth exploring. You're so passionate about all that you're doing, and it's the only way you can do this. But the reality is that we, the people we carry along also have to focus on their basic needs first, right? So what's your perspective on financial independence? And how will you motivate, you know, somebody in the young generation today that choose uh, working in the social sector over, you know, working with the McKinsey or working with uh, any such organization? Because that's also part of their ambition. Yeah. I mean, that's such a good question. I think that, you know, when I started my work, it really was not financially viable to be in the social sector. You had to really sacrifice financially to do it. And I feel very, very blessed that I had the support of family in my early years while I was finding my feet. And many, many people don't have that that support. I think today, Emma, it's just different. You can't compete for sure with corporate salaries, but you can earn a really decent salary working at a leading nonprofit today in a way in which that wasn't possible in the past. And I think the the thing to evaluate for people is what are the things that you really value? Like, how do you define profit? You know, usually when we say profit or wealth, we talk about like financial wealth, but there are so many different types of wealth, right? So I have been very inspired by a dear friend of mine, Nippon, who introduced me to this concept of multiple forms of wealth. And what he says is, think about the social network you have when you work in an organization like Teach for India. I mean, anybody gets sick and it is like magic. Someone puts out a mail and within minutes, this community has mobilized the money needed. Somebody needs anything and there are five people there for them, even people who they don't know necessarily. So there is social wealth. There's time wealth, right? Like all of us have a limited number of years in the world? How do we want to spend our time? So 
I think when you start expanding the forms of wealth that you care about, and then you stack up working at a mainstream corporate versus working at a nonprofit. And of course, you think about your own inclination and passion, right? Because we've had people at McKinsey who've been massive contributors strategically and otherwise to our work. And so there is no good place to be. It's really like what the right match is for you. But I do think oversimplifying it to you get low pay in the social sector is actually oversimplifying it. And that's not the right thing to do, because I think the benefits that you get here of network, of just meaning, like today, with all the rising levels of stress and anxiety in the world, we're realizing that so much of long-term well-being doesn't just come from a nine-to-five job and switching off on weekends. That's oversimplifying well-being. Well-being comes from an enduring sense of purpose, a feeling that you're having impact, a group of people around you who love you and will support you, a lifestyle you want to lead. There's so many different components to well-being. And I think the social sector fares poorly on the financial compared to the corporate sector, but fares really richly on many of the other dimensions. You've given a very, very honest perspective, actually, Shaheen, to the whole thing, you know. It's almost like you've released people even from a sense of guilt, actually. This has been absolutely beautiful. Um, Any parting thoughts for aspiring leaders as they find their own greatness? Yeah, I mean, just like for everybody to do as much as they can possibly do. I just wanted to share the story in response to that question in particular, because I had a a student when I was at Akansha called Latif, and he was one of these amazing students. He just was good at everything. Like teachers just loved him. We all adored him. And when he was in his early 20s, he suddenly got a, a respiratory illness and he passed away 12 hours after that. He used to live in a a small, tiny home in the community with his grandfather, and he adored his grandfather. And the next day after he passed away, I was with his grandfather in the community. And his grandfather said, I knew that Latif was really unwell. And I gave him 15,000 rupees to go to a private hospital and not to a government hospital. And Latif, without telling anyone, because he didn't want his grandfather, who was severely arthritic, to go back to work, hid the 15,000 rupees, went to a government hospital, passed away 12 hours later. Again, one doesn't know if that would have been any different in a different hospital. But that day, I was just so amazed at how much we have the capacity to give as human beings. And from this 21-year-old kid, I said, you know, I'm in the business of giving. Like, I thought my whole life was about giving, but I know nothing about our capacity to give and how deep that is. And so my answer to your question would be, like, the world needs us to do as much as we possibly can in whatever way we want and for whatever issue we want. But I think just reminding ourselves that there is no limit on how much we're capable of giving. Like every time I think of Latif, that is what I remember. I want to ask you one last question. How do you stay grounded in these times? Can you share a practice of yours that helps you to stay like that? I mean, I think just surrounding myself with people that I love and spending a lot of time with children. Uh, Gandhiji said this, but like, there is so much that you can learn from watching children that I think as adults, we somehow lose a lot of the things that came naturally to us as children. And just looking at children, being with them, seeing their joy, being joyful with them, I think those are the pieces and really learning to see inspiration. I've realized that that's a skill to look for the good and to find the good and then to talk about the good and to repeat those stories to people. I think those are some of the things. I'm a huge 
passionate fan of animals. I don't know how I didn't bring that up right until the end of this this podcast, but I have two dogs at home who I adore spending time with my kids. So all all the regular stuff and trying to live a whole life and trying to always learn something new. So for the last two years, I've been desperately trying to learn how to paint, but that's been like a new adventure in my life. And that's been very special for me as well. It's your birthday tomorrow. And uh, <laughs> you, you spoke to me about being with your pets and you spoke to me about flowers. What does it mean? And I read a little bit about it, but I didn't get to really understand. So before we end the call, let's talk about the flowers and then I'll wish you a happy birthday and we'll end the oh, day. That's so sweet. I mean, I love flowers and my favorite flowers are, are poppies. I used to live in Greece. And so I remember like hills of wild poppies growing. But I think I just make it a practice once a week to to walk down to my local flower shop and to buy flowers for the house. I think they remind you that everything changes very quickly and they they bring so much beauty into your day and your world. So that's that's what they mean to me. Beautiful. Thank you very much, Shaheen. This was truly special and it's been a very inspiring conversation. Thank you so much for this. Thank you very much for listening. All my guests have brought their most vulnerable selves on Atlanta Diaries. And even if a small segment of these conversations can help champion the journey of one person, it's going to be really worth it. I do have a request for you. Please share this podcast on your social media and with your family and friends. Our society is constantly evolving and Atlanta Diaries must too. I really appreciate if you can leave your feedback in the form of a review or a rating. These are impactful and rousing stories that need to be shared far and wide. See you next time for another one on Atlanta Diaries.